technical gears. So I've got here um, the project with uh, all of the things worked out for exercise four. And I was just going to first address um, a couple of the points. Um, one of the questions that we got in email was uh, what was expected uh, in terms of describing the relationship between uh, the catchments and the stream links uh, as, uh, as calculated using the vector data set and also the catchment raster and the um, stream link raster. So um, if I, let me switch into where this is uh, showing me all visible layers. If I, for example, click on uh, that catchment there, we will see that the identify button shows me uh, that the catchment polygon is, has the identifier, um, well, it's this catchment polygon with a grid code of 75. If we look at the uh, catchment uh, raster, it's also got an identifier of 75. So uh, one of the relationships is that the uh, grid code that's associated with the catchment polygon is the same as the grid value in the catchment raster. Um, David, can you just expand that to... one out? Can you just expand the one out that you just pointed to, the catchment raster? Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it expands. Okay, there you go. There there, you go. Um, so it shows the, the value yeah. of the pixel is 75. Uh, you don't pay any attention. To, the object IDs are, are somewhat arbitrary. It's the values you have to look at. So the 75 and then the catchment polygon also has a grid code of uh, 75. If I was to zoom right close into uh, where I'm seeing the, uh, seeing the streams um, and uh, click, on one of the, click on one of the streams, uh, we should, uh, we now also see that the stream link raster has shown a value and it's also got a value of 75. And if I look at my drainage line feature class, it's also got a, a grid code value of 75. So the drainage line grid code inherited a value from uh, the stream link uh, raster and the uh, uh, catchment polygon uh, feature class inherited the value from the catchment raster. Uh, and you have to keep track of which things are rasters and which things are vectors. You can see that on the, on the left in the table of contents. If it's showing up with a, well, I guess you might have to, uh, you might have to actually look inside the properties or remember how you created it. But if I look at the properties of that and look at source, I'll uh, learn that it's a, a raster. Whereas if I look at the catchment polygons and properties and source, I see it's a geodatabase feature class. Um, if I was to go to a different location and uh, click, now I'm on. Uh, catchment uh, with a value of 79. The catchment polygon has a grid code of 79. The stream link has a pixel value of 79. That's the raster. And the drainage line has a grid code of 79. So it's all that one-to-one that -one relationship and association. Um, and the sort of diagram that we might have drawn, I'm going to jump ahead and steal a little bit of the review um, lectures thunder here, but the diagram that we might have drawn is something uh, like that, where uh, we indicate that uh, the unique identifiers match between the grid code and the drainage line and the, uh, the raster value of the, the links and the grid code and the polygons and the raster value in the, in the catchments. Um, and the catchments and the uh, Stream links also have the, um, there's, there's also a, an association from the, the grid code and the catchment polygons and the grid code, the grid code and the drainage line, which indicates that this polygon drains to that uh, drainage line. So do I need to click around to anything more to explore that, or were there any other questions uh, related to that? That sounds like we're good here. We're good there. Okay. There was a, another question that was a little bit of a, a subtlety. Um, 
and that's the um, determination of length from uh, the NHD flow lines. So let me zoom back out to uh, the, um, the full extent of the map. Let me uh, add the NHD flow line. So this is, uh, this is from the shape file that uh, we downloaded uh, from NHD Plus, and I've just, just added that. Um, let, so uh, I guess um, let me remove it and add it again just to uh, show you where it was coming from. So um, I'm inside the NHD Plus geodatabase, that's, or NHD Plus uh, Great Basin. Uh, there's an NHD Plus 16 folder, the snapshot, the hydrography, the flow line, shape file. We were asking you to work with a shape file version because uh, if you look at the attribute table for that, you will see that it's got uh, the comma ID. If you downloaded the file geodatabase version, it has a different field that's a little bit more awkward to involve, to use. In terms of the length calculations, there's uh, one field here that's actually calculated by NHD, and that's uh, one quantity to use. But if that wasn't available and you needed to calculate length uh, using the GIS, you'd need to sort of pay attention to what I'll do next. So the first thing we had in the exercise, or one point in the exercise, was to basically select the, um, select the features that we, uh, we want and, uh, and extract them. So I'm going to do the select by location, and I'm going to pick from the NHD flow lines that are, uh, have their center in the basin. And if I run that selection, let me make the table a bit smaller so that uh, we can see more of the, the map. Um, we see we've now got, we've, we've now got these, these features. Uh, the features that are within our basin are selected. The ones outside of the basin are not selected. So. I'm now going to uh, save them. And this is where uh, the, some of the subtleties came in. Um, if I go to export the features, um, when we export features, when we've got a set of features selected, it's only going to act on the ones that are selected. Um, I'm going to put that inside of the base map geodatabase. That's important. Because uh, on the outside, this has a different projection. It's whatever we got from uh, National Hydrography data set. When I put it in my base map feature data set, it inherits the projection of that. And that's going to calculate lengths according to that coordinate system. We chose that coordinate system to be the UTM coordinate system for this area that uh, is a good one to uh, be using. So. Uh, it looks like I have, a f I was going to save it NHD streams, so I'll just call it NHD streams 2. I've done this al already, so I'll save it as a, as a different name. And then I can run that. Um, so uh, let's see what I got here for, for NHD streams 2. You see I just got the streams in my watershed. And if I look at its attribute table, you'll see that there is a, a shape length field um, and uh, the values there are things like 3,074 meters, which corresponds roughly to the 3.058 kilometers. There's not an exact correspondence and those differences are um, in the way that length has been calculated here by the GIS is perhaps uh, with a different projection than uh, the way the national data sets did it. But they reasonably close. And if you do things like uh, right click here and look at the statistics, you get um, a mean value that you can see. Uh, did I do the right field? Um, yeah. Um, I got a sum of 382 uh, kilometers there. And if I do. Um, statistics on the sh 
shape length, I get a sum of 382,300, and that's the meters to kilometers conversion. So there's a reasonable correspondence. A mistake that is really easy to make, and some people are making, is uh, if we go back to these flow lines and uh, we um, export the features, but we don't put it in the um, base map, we put it just outside, and I'm just going to call this in HD streams uh, 3. Now I haven't actually got control over what uh, the projection is going to be. And then we look at the attribute table of this, and uh, you'll see that these shape length numbers are little itty bitty numbers that are uh, not very meaningful. Um, and that's actually, if you can look at the uh, properties of this, and you'll find that the coordinate system is given here GCS North American. So it's actually done the, it's done the calculation of length in degrees. So it's, it's measured degrees in the x direction, degrees in the y direction, and interpret that as length. We know that degrees in the x and the y direction are actually different when you're not right at the equator. So um, these quantities are, are not meaningful. That's a real easy mistake to make. So I want to just point out, and if, you, if you're getting these numbers that look uh, unusually small, that's probably the mistake that's happened. And it can be resolved by putting the feature class inside of the base map um, feature data set, which controls the coordinate system to be consistent. Um, so that was the one, the one thing uh, to, to note. Um, there were also some, we also were having you look at uh, drainage density calculations. So let me turn that one off, turn those flow lines off. Um, um, if I go to those, those streams, that's where I calculate the length. We've got about 382 kilometers. If I look at the drainage lines from uh, de delineating from the DEM, if I put that up above, you'll see that the drainage density, there's not nearly as many streams. Sometimes uh, the streams uh, we delineate from the DEM just stop whereas NHD plus continues. So that was the threshold that we chose for delineating our streams. The fact that we're getting um, shorter streams, not quite as many streams, uh, means that we expect our drainage density calculated this way to get less. So when you uh, calculate the drainage density from the National Hydrography Dataset streams and from the DM delineated streams, you shouldn't be surprised that the numbers are um, differ by uh, a reasonably sizable factor, about a factor of two. Um, and it's uh, because of that. So um, those were all the things that I thought, uh, well, th those are the questions that, that came in that I wanted to just sort of clarify. Um, okay. any, any other questions for exercise four? Yes. So what's the, que the question is? Uh -huh. so, so the question is, if you'd chosen a threshold drainage area that was the same as the brown lines here, I guess. Um, the difference is that the NHD flow lines are the digital translation of what the original mappers did from aerial photographs. They didn't have anything to do with DEM processing at all. This was back in 1970 or something. Uh, most of the topographic maps in the country were produced in the 1960s and 70s. That was when the peak of that effort was going on. So this was actually traced out from aerial photographs 
and whatever decision was made by the cartographer at that time is what you see there are the blue lines. And indeed you can even see sometimes and when you put these maps together on the state lines, you know, the streams suddenly get different density when you go across the state line. Well, hey, that's because somebody else did it on the other side of the state line. So there's, there is no such thing as a threshold drainage area for the brown lines. It was a completely different process that was used to create them. Any so other? you can see some of, some of that. So here I've, uh, I've turned off many of the layers and we're just seeing in the blue lines what's in the base map. So we're looking at a topographic base map which is a scanned version of the topographic maps that were started in the 60s and we don't actually know when this one was last updated. But you can here you can see there's a blue line that goes to there and then there's a dotted blue line which would indicate an ephemeral stream. If we turn on the drainage lines that we delineate from the DEM, that is actually a remarkable uh, coincidence there that it's uh, so close. You can see some of them going on, but this one here, Spawn Creek, the, uh, the blue line and the valley that you can see in the contours doesn't correspond exactly with where the DEM delineation goes. If we turn on the National Hydrography streams, you'll see that many times these will start exactly where the blue line on the map starts because uh, that's how they were uh, generated. Um, they don't line up exactly and that's because there's uh, been approximations uh, that have come into the, the digitization of them. So, uh, yes, so you can, by, by, exper by exploring around on these base maps, you can get an understanding of some of these different issues. So the, um, there are two basic map scales that the digitization was done on. It's a 1 to 100,000 scale maps, which is what the NHD Plus uses, and then more detailed 1 to 24,000 scale maps, which was what the base topographic mapping system of the country uh, used. So those also have different numbers of streams. Generally there's about three times the length in the uh, 1 to 24,000 scale maps as what there is in the 1 to 100,000 scale maps. 1 to 100,000 scale maps take one degree by one degree, and 1 to 24,000 scale maps take 1 16th of a degree by 1 16th of a degree. Um, so there's a distinction there also about how detailed the mapping was that was done uh, originally. Yes. Yeah, so, so if we were to go there today, like where would we find the stream? That's a really good question. So where would you find the stream? In North Carolina they had this um, enterprising person who had a GPS on his back. Literally, they had a stream finder and he hacked his way through the brush and he fought with water moccasins and all this kind of stuff. You had to they had this whole thing about, you know, where is a stream and, you know, where does a stream stop, become a permanent stream and be an, an ephemeral stream. So if you really want to do it, yeah, you, you get to be one of these you know, water moccasin fighter kind of people and, and you go there and you figure it out. Uh, that's really the only way to do it right, is to actually go there in the field and figure it out. Um, but, you know, not many places have the resources to do that. Paris? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. So the question, Dr. Tavertan, is would the extent of the stream itself actually alter because of climate change? Um, well, I, yeah, I guess we, we don't really know. There's, there are people who are working on uh, problems like uh, landscape evolution and trying to uh, have better ways to identify these channel heads. Uh, some of the people in Texas may know uh, Dr. Pava Pasavakwa, and she's got a program that uh, tries to uh, look at through various um, uh, sophisticated uh, digital filters that examine the curvature of the, um, of the topography exactly where the channel heads start. In the, in the lecture I gave you earlier, I spoke about the way we do it in Taudem, which is trying to look at the stream drops, which is a little bit of a coarser approach than that. Um, but I mean, as if you get much more rainfall, uh, there, there have been studies that, that have tried to relate drainage density to climate. So if the climate was to change significantly, you might uh, end up with this, uh, channels changing. It's going to be pretty, it's a pretty slow process. I mean, for those who are familiar with uh, having walked around here, I mean, that's, this there is Tony Grove Lake. So uh, we know there's a stream going down from it. 
So uh, the, the NHD streams also suggest that there is the stream draining into Tony Grove Lake, and if you've hiked up to Naomi Peak, you might be able to find that. That is uh, White Pine Lake, and there's a stream coming out of that. I mean, you guys could hike around and see where some of these other ones, uh, whether they're actually manifested or not. I think many of these streams, uh, you would find that there isn't actually much evidence on the, on the ground for flowing water. Any other questions? Um, David, can you take the measure tool and just open that up briefly? Yeah, keep going. There, there. Okay. Um, and isn't there a thing called geodesic measure? Uh, measure distance? Yeah, there distance is. Option. It's on geodesic yeah, three. Yeah. So I wanted to just point this out. Um, there's different ways. In one of the earlier homeworks, we had this thing like, what's the length between two places? You know, Salt Lake City and New York, and there was a lot of confusion about, well, it's Great Circle is this, and projected it's that, and they're sometimes quite different. So there are tools here. Um, I don't know what loxodromic means in Great Elliptic, but geodesic means the, sort of the shortest path across the Earth's surface. And so there's, uh, there are ways to do that correctly with the spheroidal Earth. And you can actually measure exactly without all these approximations like what we've been doing. Like from here to there, the real distance is this. Um, and I just wanted to point that out. Um, that you've got some access to tools that can do that in the measure tools that you have here in ArcGIS. Any other thoughts? Okay. It seems like there was a question in email to do with exercise three. Do you remember it and slope? Do you remember what the question uh, is? So the yes, yeah, so the the oh yes. Go, go on. You want to go take it take it out? We'll go frame the question while I think I'm going to look for where the um, pull up the exercise. Uh -huh. Um. So I think the question might have been, why was, uh, when we did the hand calculations at point A, did we get a, a larger value for um, the slope using the Esri method than if we calculated with the slope using the um, the the DA to the uh, D-infinity methods. Was that basically yeah, that's it? That's right, yeah. So you got um, about 4% slope for the D8 and D-infinity and about 10 or 11% for the Esri method on point A, for example. Is there a place I can get... Did you put the link to the solution on your website? Yes, I do. Um, so if you okay, go to my website and... You go and pull that up. Yeah, so if you go to exercise 3... Three, 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 right at the end. There we go, EX3 solution. And this solution was made up by Dr. Tarverton, I have to say, so. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so there we have all the, the mathematics involved in that. Uh, at uh, location A, we have um, the slope is 0.114. So remember the number about just 11 11 percent. Uh, here we evaluated it uh, with um, with Excel, um, but when we did the slope calculating from uh, D8, we got a 0.042, and when we did a calculation using D infinity, well, we got about 0.044. So I think that you can get a sense of that by looking at the numerical values. The D8 and the D infinity ones are only calculating slope downwards from the center cell. It's actually so 26.4 to 26 or 25.8. Those are the only 
well, those are sort of the general slope is in that direction, and it's about 0.4 units across the across the 10 meters. The um, Esri slope is using all of these nine grid cells uh, around here that include these high ones, the 28.6, the 27.9, that are about uh, two units bigger than the, the middle value. So there's quite a steep slope from there down to this one, and then a flatter slope from there. And so when you average the sort of steep area and the flat area, you get an average slope that's, that's steeper. So the, the Esri approach uses the higher ground as well, or at least the, the slope, the, the standard slope function uses the higher ground. The D8 method and the D infinity method, which are really designed for where water's going to flow, uh, only use the lower grid cells. So I think that explains that difference. And you, so then you get to debating, okay, which ones are, are better and what the purposes are. And I think that uh, using the standard slope function is probably best where you're doing things like uh, the slope for a radiation calculation or for um, some sort of other general calculation where you might need slope. But if you're specifically interested in where the water is going to go, the higher terrain is less relevant. It's only going to go downhill. Paras, you have another question? Yeah, I almost answered, but which one is close to reality in the actual sense? So the question is really which is closer to reality? And I'd like to respond to that in a somewhat different way. When I wrote that original um, handout about slope, it was to draw the distinction between the slope as the derivative of a surface and the slope as the, the slope of a line between two points. Now the D8 slope direction is literally the slope of a line between two points. And the other version, the Esri's tool, is the derivative of a surface, right? It's a fundamentally different thing. It's just different. You're measuring something different. And the D infinity solution is a somewhat a bit of a compromise between the two, right? It's taking several points into account and it's calculating a slope that's not exactly along um, between two points, but it could be intermediate between them. Um, so I don't think you should expect the results to be the same. They're measuring something different. Now, David, could you go down to the, the summary table that you've got below about the uh, results of the different approaches on the demo.asc um, uh, results. If you come down... Uh, no, this one? No, keep going. Yeah, that one. This one? Yeah, so if you look here, see the minimum and maximum values, um, 0 to 149, 0.066 to 148. Uh, 0.001 to 151, they're almost the same. So, it, And when you look at the range for those three methods, when e evaluated across a large DEM, it isn't, it isn't any different really. So uh, it would be interesting actually if we had the mean there to see if there was any difference. But you can see from the minimum and maximum, the range has actually not changed at all from, for those three different methods. So the distinctions that we're seeing at this particular example, the point A and B, are really the product of the values that are right around those cells and not generally what's available across the whole grid. Any other, any other questions and thoughts? Okay, should we declare victory here then? Okay, we'll declare victory on the exercises and uh, Dr. Maynard will tell us uh, about the exam. Okay. Well, I've declared I'll victory stop on the exercises you too. I've you. managed to do all the grading, which I have to say was a fairly major occupation of mine for the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, so I have made up a review uh, session here, a review sheet. and a set of review slides. And I don't think we're going to have time to go through all these slides, but you can read through them yourself anyway. Um, so let me get those. Open that. Get this thing.
Okay, so I've made up this review sheet and I've used here the um, Bloom's Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. Now I know you're all familiar with Bloom's Taxonomy, right? Yes, absolutely. Who's familiar with Bloom's Taxonomy? Okay, cool. <laughs> Better known than it used to be. I started doing this actually at the very beginning of my academic career. My wife has a degree in science education and she was the one that taught me about Bloom's Taxonomy. Now it's much more widely used. Um, but it was. Can you can you minimise the little thing that's uh, made I'm the sorry, black box? Got that bad person there, yeah. Um, <laughs> and just to um, summarise the idea here, uh, Bloom's taxonomy builds this hierarchy of knowledge, starting with basic facts, like Austin is the capital of Texas. Comprehension. What does that mean? Well, the legislature meets here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. We're going to have a few questions here, define and explain questions, define some concept and explain what it means, or draw a diagram or something like that. Those are going to be level one, two type knowledge, just with words and pictures. Define and explain. The next level, application, means calculate a formula, like convert degrees, minutes and seconds into decimal degrees. That's an example of a level three. Level four, analysis means break a problem into parts and solve it sequentially like what we're doing with this drainage densities and other things where you've got to have or I I average precipitation, you've got a series of pieces that have to be put together. This exam only covers levels one through four. There's nothing here about synthesis and about evaluation. Where are you going to do synthesis in this course? The term project. The term project is level five. Uh, where are you going to do evaluation? Advantages and limitations of alternative approaches. The final exam. Okay, so the final exam is level six. You'll find there's lots of comparisons about how should we do things in alternative ways and so on. That's when you're supposed to be able to bring everything together and synthesize and figure out the whole thing. Synthesis means creating new knowledge, and that's what you're doing in your term project. So the midterm exam is only these level one through four uh, type um, questions. So we're going to start with the application analysis problems, which will be the main part of the exam and fill in the gaps between the subjects that those don't cover with application, define and explain questions that examine things at the bottom end here. So with that explanation, let's go back to the sheet. So I have classified all of the lecture materials that we've been through according to this scheme. So you can see which lectures we expect you to know things with application and um, analysis level understanding, and which ones it's just like just understand the concept here. Don't, don't worry about doing a lot of calculations. We've also got here listed a set of skills that we expect you to have mastered by this point. So I won't go through all these um, one by one, but you can go through them yourself. And we've attempted to reinforce these skills with the exercises that we've given you by the computer and also the ones that we, we've asked you to do uh, for, uh, by hand. And then at the end here, I've also listed uh, lectures. If you want to go back and watch any particular lectures again, you can do that. Uh, and also the reading materials that we've given you at various points to supply additional background material about map projections and coordinate systems and racial, uh, race analysis, um, slope and aspect, and so on. Uh, there's a, oh, and some stuff about the hydrology tools. Um, there's some guidance here about what you can do uh, in the exam. You can bring a, a cheat sheet, eight and a half by 11 sheet. You can write anything on it that you want. It can be on both sides. It can be microscopic. You, know, you can yeah, have something that you have to have a you know, magnifying <laughs> glass to read. <laughs> um, I think making up a good cheat sheet is actually a good way of thinking out what's important and summarizing it. And it actually has an educational value in doing that. Um, I don't want to see your cheat sheet. You can take it home again when you're done. Uh, but don't you know, get all exercised about, I'm going to forget this formula or I'm going to do something. You can put it on your cheat sheet. Um, you have to have a calculator. Yeah, and you have to know how to use a calculator. No computer here. So you have to be able to use a calculator. And I know this is getting to be kind of an arcane skill now, but um, it's one of the realities of doing in-class exams. And I like nice diagrams. So please if, bring a straight edge so that you can draw nice square boxes if that's what you're called on to do. Um, so no books in the exam, but you can have a cheat sheet. Um, 
but you have to have a calculator and be able to work with a calculator, know, you know how to do cosine on my, my calculator and that kind of thing. So this is just a general review here. Are there any questions about, um, about the Bloom's taxonomy and this kind of stuff? Dr. Tarberton, anything you want to add? Uh, no. Any questions you guys have? Okay, let's roll along then. So, I've tried to assemble, oh by the way, and as well as uh, these resources, uh, Dr. Tarbaton and I both have exposed our exams for the last six years. So, and my work spreadsheet, so every exam that we've given for the last six years is here, so you can take a look at the exam and go, oh my gosh, I'm crazy, I don't know what the National Elevation Data Set's all about. Or then you can say, that's okay, because I can now look up the answer the National Elevation <laughs> Data Set is. <laughs> so don't panic, huh? There's six practice exams here. So this is, you know, we're not trying to be obscure. That you can follow this through um, and you'll see very, you know, we're going to do something in a consistent way to what we've done before and it's all laid out there. In fact, I don't know of anybody else who gives you six practice exams, huh? <laughs> no, nobody ever gave me any practice exams when I was a grad student. We had to uh, kind of see if we could psych out the professor on our own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I divided this review into four parts, using ArcGIS for water resources, location and measurement on the Earth, spatial analysis and hydrologic analysis. And those roughly correspond to um, the first four exercises that we've had in the, uh, in the course. So firstly using ArcGIS for water resources. So I put again this, uh, this uh, quote from Scott Morehouse, um, that's a good friend of mine, uh, about the whole idea behind a geographic data model. So a typical question could be here, What's a geographic data model? I mean, I just say, hey, define a geographic data, the term geographic data model and explain why it's necessary and why it's useful. That's the kind of a question that you might get asked. Um, the, the idea in GIS that every feature has associated with it a record. This is true for which kind of data, vector or raster data? It's vector. Yeah, this is true for vector data. For raster data, every cell value, every cell has a value, but there's not necessarily an associated record in a, in a data table that contains that value, but it's true for vector data, for points, lines, and areas. Um, we've talked, and Dr. Tarberton was just uh, explaining the significance of the terms geodatabase, uh, which is a general container for geospatial data sets, and feature data set, which is a container for feature classes or vector data sets with a common coordinate system. Um, a feature class is something that goes, it's a point line or area coverage. I expect you to know what these concepts mean. What's a geodatabase? What's a raster? What's a table? You know, how does a table differ from a feature class? So let me ask that question. How does a table differ from a feature class? You guys? Okay, so the table's not necessarily associated with something on the map. A table can just be a table. So how do we associate the table with something on the map? Mm, yep, this is a special kind of table. What does the table have if it's got something on the map? X, Y, but yeah, it's got shape. It's got that attribute that's called shape. So all the geometries bunched up there in that attribute shape. So a feature class is simply a table with a shape field added into it, actually. How does, how does uh, a raster differ from a feature class? Don't all speak at once. <coughs> Rasters are continuous where Feature classes are discrete. Okay, that's fair. So rasters are continuous. They go everywhere. Um, feature classes are discrete. So let me explain this in terms of this table that I've got in front of me. So if I digitized around the edge of this table, I would get a polygon. That's a feature class. That's a feature, actually. Geographic feature. 
it describes the spatial extent of this table. If I was to have this as a raster, what that would mean is that there's a surface on here and the value of every place on that surface would be defined. So the rasters are like air. They go everywhere. The, the feature classes are always discrete. It's always, I'm either here or I'm not here. I'm either a point, I'm a line, I'm an area. But they're discrete spatial features that describe things in the spatial domain, but they're not necessarily in existence everywhere. They could be um, existing or not. Is that clearer or not? So f features are always points, lines, and areas obtained for lines and areas by joining points together. Rasters are always surfaces, always continuous functions. But there, so you can see there's some good define and explain questions in there, right? What's, what's raster? What's vector? What's the difference between a feature class and a raster? Think those out. Make sure you've got that clear in your mind. What's the difference between a feature data set and a geodatabase? Um, Dr. Tarleton mentioned the significance of this, the idea of relationships and database keys, really fundamental to the concept of the linking of raster and vector data is the idea that the value in a raster becomes the grid code in a feature that's associated with that. That's what connects the uh, two sets of products from the exercise that you're just completing now. Uh, another example of where the feature codes and um, summarization using features is important is in the exercise three that I just finished grading and you're calculating the um, average areas or the average rainfall over areas by the Thiessen method. Uh, and you've got sums of products, for example, this function uh, that gets average area precipitation is computed that way. Uh, one of the concepts we've spent a lot of time on is about visualization and map symbology. How do you understand, how do you see uh, map information? With, um, along with geoprocessing and the database. Visualization, geoprocessing, the database. Those are the three biggies. You know, you've got catalog, ArcMap, and the toolbox. Uh, we've gone through, and Dr. Tarbotton has taught you in a very excellent way, uh, how to do geoprocessing with a toolbox and using Model Builder to execute modeling functions. It's really a marvelous uh, uh, function. Actually, was in a, a landscape architect who figured out this. I remember the this was kind of a, like a subterranean project at Edisbury. Well, I won't tell you the story. Scott Moore has tried to kill it at one point, but uh, it managed to survive. Um, these are the basic data sets that we've used in working with the NHD Plus data set. And of those, the National Elevation data set and Hydrography data set are really fundamental. And so I want you to be sure that you can explain, you know, where those things come from, what the relationship is between them. Um, you've seen this chart about the National Water Model several times. Uh, one of the things that I spoke with some passion about yesterday was how, with the National Water Model, we've succeeded in putting water right into the GIS. I remember the first time that I, Jack Dangerman saw this uh, the simulation. We did it at the White House, so, I don't know, a couple of years ago, when Obama was still president. And, uh, uh, and he was in Washington, and he saw this map. And he just went crazy. And I, I, I've never seen him so happy in my whole life. I've, I've known him for more than 20 years. And it happened that I was in Washington as well. So I started getting all these messages from his office. Call me, call me, call me. Oh, OK, Jack, OK. Anyway, we, I went over to the Capitol. He was there having a reception. And he just said, this is so fantastic. And for him, as a technology leader as he is, when he saw the National Water Model, suddenly something that he had had in his mind for years was realized. And that was that the water was inside the GIS. This wasn't you know, GIS being used as a pre-processing routine for some hydrology model or something like that. This was a fundamental change, a fundamental difference in the connection between the two subjects. And then we've had, at the end of um, exercise two, I asked you to do some calculations with the National Water Model Forecast Viewer uh, that's enabling you to get particular flow charts for a particular location, which I think is really cool, actually, to be able to follow the flood like we did on the Lano River a couple of days ago. Next location and measurement on the Earth. There's lots of hand-done homeworks that you've had uh, to relate to that. Um, typical question, uh, 
for example, draw a diagram that shows how to define latitude. So I would give you the oval and say, hey, define, you draw a diagram and explain how you define latitude on that. Or same thing for longitude. How do you define longitude? So draw a diagram and explain how you, how you define longitude. Uh, here's an example from one of the quizzes. The term, define the term latitude and illustrate your definition using a diagram. Define the term longitude. Illustrate your definition using a diagram. Um, and here's my answers for how to do that. So and I've drawn these diagrams. and I, I write in pencil, by the way. M most people write in pencil on exams. So if you do ink, it's harder to grade exams that have done in ink, frankly, because I'm grading in ink. And ink you know, but anyway, if you want to use ink, I guess you can. Um, I like pencil because you can erase things. You can see a few erasures there and kind of get things right. Um, questions on geographic coordinates. So uh, really an old um, favorite is to calculate the latitude and longitude in decimal degrees for points that are given uh, in degrees, minutes, and seconds, and then to calculate the distance between them, assuming a spherical Earth with radius um, 6371 kilometers. Now, given the degree of complication of the of the great circle route, we're not going to ask you to do that calculation on a calculator. Right? That's, a, that's an Excel level calculation. So in this case, you see here that the longitudes are the same. So this calculating the distance is basically just calculating the distance along a, long, a, a um, meridian of longitude. So don't worry about, I've got to do the great circle distance um, as a calculation. And here's an example, here's the solution for that problem. Always work with, or be careful that you're working with radians. Uh, degrees are fine for numbers to tell you where you are, but radians are the true root measure of uh, angle as a fundamental measure. Uh, this is the formula for lengths on meridians and parallels. I think we've been through this a number of times now along meridians, it's always the same. This arc is r times the angle subtended. Along a parallel, it becomes different because the radius that's subtended becomes smaller as you come towards the poles. Uh, and there's some questions here from one of the exams about how to calculate how tall a Texan is from the top to the bottom, you know, from A to B, you know, how tall is Texas? Well, pretty tall, 528 <laughs> miles, actually. That's a tough <laughs> this is some material that I just inserted this morning because of the, some issues that came up that I saw when I graded uh, homework number two, I guess. Well, no, homework number one the, the one, the handwritten one. So you were given this set of parameters for the projection, uh, the Albers projection, and asked to uh, draw, take a map and put the key parameters on it. And one thing that quite a lot of people made a mistake on was that they didn't understand the existence or the significance of these terms that say false easting and false northing. They're important. So in the projected coordinate system, in this particular case, the x0, y0 is 0, 0, and the phi0, phi zero, lambda0 zero is 23 north and 96 degrees west. So in what you were asked to do for the homework, the solution looks like this, which was to draw these standard parallels, which are at 29.5 and 45.5, and the reference latitude, which is at 23, the central meridian, which is at 96 degrees west. And then you're asked to say, what is the coordinates of that, of that intersection point in the projected coordinate system? And the answer to that is 0, 0. It is not 96, 23. So if you think about it in terms of the diagram that we had just at the beginning of the semester, the first lecture that I gave, and this is the last slide in that. So we've got these point, the point, the same location in geographic coordinates is called phi zero lambda zero, the origin, and in the projector coordinate system it's x zero and y zero in the projector coordinate system. So that point, in a sense, has two coordinates associated with it. Phi zero lambda zero, x zero, y zero. This is the false easting and the false northing, the center meridian and the uh, reference latitude or the latitude of origin. Any question about that? This is a really, really important idea that quite a few people messed up in the homework. 
Uh, there's a question here about geospatial reference frames, so if you want to just go through this, it's essentially the same question as the one that you did in homework number one, and there's a solution here that I drew out about where to lay out all the um, principal lines and so on. Uh, we often we have often ask this kind of question on the exam. This is a golden oldie, so yeah, be aware of that. You know how to lay out all the parameters of the projection system and explain what they mean. Now, spatial analysis. This is moving now into the material that Dr. Tarbaton taught. Um, he's done a nice job of laying out here where the readings are for you to refresh your memory about different concepts that. Uh, were presented in class. Uh, this is a question that we asked uh, some time ago, uh, and it shows the land cover distribution of Travis County in 2006, and then you're asked to figure out how much of that of Travis County was developed in 2006. In other words, um, it's a pretty straightforward calculation where you can figure out the total number of cells and the cells that are in the developed area and take the ratio of the two quantities and you get a certain percentage. Uh, this is similar to what you did in uh, exercise number two. Um, this is a more complicated question which deals with the same kind of information but with a time step involved. So here there's a land cover lookup table like what you were working with in exercise two and here's what the land cover of Travis County was in 2001, and here's what the land cover of Tra Travis County was in 2011. And so you're asked here to calculate the area of the land cover class in 2001 and 2011, and then what the difference between them is, and therefore what the rate of increase of the developed area is per year in Travis County. And there's actually an interesting uh, conclusion that comes out of that. Uh, so if you go through this and add up all the developed areas and go through the calculations, uh, what you find is that <coughs> you've got uh, in 2001 about 25% of Travis County was developed and in 2011 about 29% uh, of Travis County was developed. So in other words it increased by 4% in developed area over a 10 year period. So there's always a lot of talk about you know how development, how fast development is happening. Well this is a nice numerical way of thinking out and just how fast development is happening. So 2% of Travis County gets developed every five years, converted into impervious areas and so on. Uh, slope and aspect. Um, we went through this discussion just earlier about the idea that there's a point-to-point -point slope like hydrologic slope, just I'm just going between two locations. Uh, and you've also got this concept of a a slope as the derivative of a surface. Now as I was going through this, I got a little bit, I started thinking about this myself and I started saying, you know, do I really, do I really understand this? So we've got um, A plus 2D plus G, so that's A plus 2D plus G, minus C plus 2F plus I, so that's something along here, divided by 8 delta. Uh, well, that's actually, there's a lot of averaging going on in there, but it's essentially divided by the distance that's traveled. And I looked at that and I thought, wait a minute, I don't get this. Because what we're doing is we're measuring in the positive x direction the difference between the beginning and the end, but we're dividing it by delta, which is actually the difference between the end and the beginning, if you think of x expanding in this direction. So there's a sort of a contrast there. Why is it done this way? You would normally think of, you know, at the end minus the beginning over at the end minus the beginning. That's the usual way we do slopes, right? But we're doing it a little bit different here. This is switch. What's the end result that we're looking for? It's the, is it the slope up or the slope down? It's the slope down. So we're looking for the thing that goes down. In other words, by definition, when we talk about a positive slope, it means a slope that's going down. Or in other words, z is dropping as x changes. So that's why this formula is set up the way it is. It's actually measuring what's going down rather than what's going up. Normally when we do derivatives, 
know, the Y, the Z, or the Z, the X, the Y, X, we're always thinking about things that are going up, up in the direction where we're moving. In this case, we're thinking about things that are going down in the direction that we're moving, and that's why it's been organized the way that it is. Um, similarly, we've got a definition here about slope magnitude, um, and then here's a sample calculation where you're being asked to just go through these calculations and do it the Esri slope way. And I, you know, having just graded all this homework, I would say, actually I was pretty impressed that people largely got this figured out. It's a pretty confusing subject, but I was uh, um, appropriately impressed by the fact that you managed to work this out. Um, the component of this that is obviously confusing is all this thing about the angles. I mean, I can see people just about blowing their brains out, <laughs> <laughs> trying to work out the stuff with the angles. What I find most useful is I look at the components of these vectors and look at the signs on them and kind of just figure it out from that. And once I figure out, wait a minute, now that one's positive and that one's negative, that means we've got to be over here in this quadrant and you know, I work it out like that. I don't, there, there's probably some automatically mathematical way to figure this out, but I just look at, so for example, if the, the ZDX term is positive, uh, that means that you're going to be um, on the right-hand side of the zero and if if the y, if the z, the y is negative, that means you're going to be on the negative side, be in the lower right quadrant for that particular uh, component. Um, here's the formulas for how to calculate the uh, aspect, and then there's some examples here for how to do this for this particular grid, how to do the hydrologic, oh, that's it, uh, Esri slope and the aspect and some angles like this. In the homework, some of you had really beautiful diagrams for the angles, some of you had some hand-drawn stuff, and some of you didn't have much of a diagram at all. So clearly this question about how to do aspect and all that is a tricky question. And when I first saw that, well, Dr. Tarverton's method starts from the east and it goes this way, and the aspect starts from north and it goes that way, I, you know, I go, oh my god, why can't they just kind of do it all the same? Um, but I think there's actually, on reflection, some value in it being done differently because those, the d infinity slope and the aspect and the Esri slope are measuring two different things and not necessarily the same. If you start measuring them so they look the same, they really aren't the same. Um, there's a, so a question that we could ask in the final exam is something like this d8, d infinity, Esri slope thing, like what was in uh, questions one and two of the exercise three. Uh, there's a discussion here about the idea of resampling for different uh, sizes of cells. And here's a question that was asked uh, in one exam. So you've got a, um, a set of cells here which have uh, different values of precipitation on this um, surface. And then uh, you have to calculate the mean for a subset, a sub-area of that, which is actually just shown here. And so you have to go through a calculation and figure out, oh, I've got a more resolved set of cells that covers a sub-area of this, and I've got to calculate the average over those cells and not over the other ones. And you have to deal with the different sizes of cells in doing that. And there's some examples of how to work that out here. Um, a similar thing for the calculation of the average precipitation of a, a, over a watershed. So in the equivalent calculation to the one that you did in exercise two, where you calculated the average uh, precipitation by the season method, what we've done here is to provide a table so that you can actually just fill in the table. You don't have to kind of figure it all out in your head because it makes it easier to grade, among other things, if you have to fill out the table. And so using the relationships, as Dr. Tarverton was describing earlier, you can uh, build up the analysis and fill out the different requirements here and get the uh, average precipitation. And finally, about hydrologic analysis. Again, here's a direction as to which of the readings that you need to follow uh, to really get the background as to the tools that you're using in exercise four. Um, and this is a, an example of uh, how to do pit filling on an elevation model. So well, the question that you're being asked here is to identify any pits by shading them and indicate the elevation to which they need to be raised 
uh, to uh, hydrologically condition the surface. So in this instance, um, there's a cell, so that in order to determine the D8 flow direction for this particular cell, number 15. So if you look at this whole grid here, it turns out there's a pit. Where's the pit? <coughs> seven. Okay, let's see. Yep, okay, that's good. Seven is a pit. This, is that the only one? Twelve. Twelve is a pit as well. So this twelve here is a pit. You can see if you look all around that it's, um, it's lower than all its neighbors. What would you have to raise cell 12 to, to okay. get yeah, to 13? So if we go from 12 to 13, then we just come out across 13 and then we're out. So if we go over here to 7, uh, what would we have to raise 7 to to get it out? Ten. No, don't it doesn't have to be raised to 10. Eight. Eight. No. Okay, if we raise 7 to 8, then 7 becomes 8, 8 goes to 8, and, uh, we're still in the hole. What do we have to raise this to? Nine. nine, yes. So seven becomes nine, eight becomes nine, and then we can go out this way. So think these things through like that, right? When it, just look around for cells that are isolated, that have cells higher than them all around, and figure out how much you have to raise them up so that they get bigger than their neighbors, and then they can flow out across the boundary. Uh, so here's... A different example, it's got higher elevations um, at the bottom of the grid and there's um, a cell here, and initially 6, which if it's raised to 14 can then uh, breach out through, uh, oops, yeah, it comes out this way. And similarly, this, these cells over here all have to be raised up to the level 10 so that they can, they can go out up the top there. So, Asking a question like this and having you shade these cells and figure out what they need to be raised to is something you should expect. Um, calculating the hydrologic slope. We've asked this a lot. Um, it's easy to sort of trip over this and not evaluate all the possibilities. So, for example, here 67 to 48 over 30 root 2, if this is a 30 meter DEM, gives you a cell uh, slope of 0.45. So you might just look at that chart and say, oh, uh, 48 is the nearest one to 67. It's the lowest. I'm done. I just calculate this slope and I'm out of here. But if you do 67 to 52, you find, oops, even though it's 52 is higher than 48, the distance is shorter and that's <coughs> enough to give this a bigger slope. Therefore, the direction is actually uh, down. Now, we often ask also whether these should be coded. So if it's straight down, what coding is that? Four, yes. One, two, four. Right. One, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one hundred twenty-eight. That's the coding system. So I sometimes just draw it on the sheet, you know, just draw some arrows and put the numbers on, and that way I don't get messed up in my mind as to what's what. Uh, similarly, here, um, calculating. I guess this is what we were just doing. We we're relating twelve to thirteen and seven to nine, and so on, and calculating the flow direction from cell 15. Um, this is a question on flow direction actually that we asked last year. Um, so what you're asked to do here is to calculate the D8 flow directions of each of these cells and then to indicate the numerical value in this box here. So in other words, you're asked to take this set of cells here, the bigger set, don't worry about the ones um, on the outer edge because they go outside, just worry about the ones that are inside the big box here, and then um, calculate the, uh, the flow directions here. So this is my answer that I worked out um, as a solution for this exam, and here I've just drawn this little uh, diagram to remind myself about the numbers in different directions. And so what I did was to start off um, with cell number 9, so if I look at 9, well let's see, 9 to 11, 9 to 9, 9 to 10, all of those are out, it has to be 9 to 8, just by definition, because that's the only one where it's got an adjacent neighbor that's lower. So you can just say right away, uh, 9 goes to 8 and, and you're done. Um, and that's in this vertical direction, 64. So, where have I got that? Uh, I don't see it there. Anyway, uh, then... Uh, On the right. 
I'm sorry? You've got it on the right. Uh, you've got 64 labeled. You're wondering where you had the 64 label that's on the, on the square on the right. Sorry. Anyway, let me keep going here. So, uh, <laughs> so okay, nine to eight by inspection. So I've just I've just got that worked out. Number two, ten to nine by inspection. So here, ten. So ten could go to eleven, fourteen, twelve, blah blah blah. Oops. By inspection, and uh, so it has to go. Uh, ten has to go to nine. So by definition, it's just straight up. Then I've got um, number three, eleven. Now 11 could go to 9, which is this way. Um, 11 could also go uh, to 8 which on the diagonal there. So I've evaluated both of those solutions and found that 11 goes to 8 is actually the better solution because even though um, it's a longer path, the slope is 0.085 compared to 0.08. That's a 32 slope. And similarly, 13 here can go anywhere. It could go to 10, it could go to 9. So here I've evaluated two solutions. One, 13 goes to 10 and one thirteen goes to 9, and picked one for the average slope. So in this case, you're asked for four flow directions, two of which are obvious just by inspection, and two of which you've got to do a calculation to figure out. And the way to go wrong on this kind of question is to not realise that there's an alternative and to just choose the obvious one without um, doing the check for the maximum slope. Um, this is a variant on the same question where the flow directions are already given, and then you're asked to define where is the drainage area that originates from that particular point, the one that's with circle. And so we've gone through the idea that associated with the flow direction is this implied grid called the flow accumulation, and you have to add up the number of cells that flow into a given cell and calculate that number. And this is the Esri flow direction uh, system. If you have a threshold drainage area, you can define from that a stream, which you're doing now in your homework, and from that you can define the watershed that drains to that point, and you can do that for very large areas um, as you've just been doing. So in this particular instance, if you look at this um, outlet cell here and then think about all the cells that flow into that, uh, you can then uh, calculate uh, which way you can define which uh, was the drainage area uh, for that cell, and then you can calculate the flow accumulation. So being able to identify what the cells are and what the flow accumulation is, is important. Notice that these cells at the top here, zero, 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 these are ones that have nothing flowing into them. This one is a zero because there's nothing flowing into them. This one looks like it should be a zero too because it's right on the edge, but it's got that one flowing into it. So this one has a flow accumulation of one. And here we've got two because we've got one coming in and then another one becomes two. Here we've got five because we've got two coming in uh, this way. We've got uh, one coming in from up above and this one, that's four. And uh, we've got one, two, three here. So this one has five flow accumulation. So it's a bit confusing to actually get these numbers straight. And one of the things that you can do as a check at the end is to find out how many cells you've got total. So this way it's two, four, six, uh, and five is 11. And that means a flow accumulation of 10 at the outlet because you don't count the one that you're in. So you can check that you get the right total at the end just by doing that kind of a number. And it was that area, if you remember I showed before, that was used in that calculation of the average precipitation uh, to get the uh, precipitation over that drainage area. Um, and this, yeah. So I guess there's a, there's a question at the bottom here that says, uh, draw on your diagram the stream that would be defined with a flow accumulation threshold of four square kilometres. So I've drawn this line here, so it says centre to centre to centre, whoops, um, which is all the cells that have more than four flow accumulations <coughs> into them. So the length of that is two, and there's a total area here, including the cell at the outlet, of 11, so the drainage area here is 2 over 11. So this is sort of a simple version of the geomorphology parameters about drain network density that uh, Dr. Tarleton was just discussing. So uh, yeah, here's some rules that I went over at the beginning, uh, and uh, yeah, I've, I've already reviewed that. Are there any questions that you have? Yes. 
Um, for the timing of the exam, since the class is technically scheduled like 12.30 to 2, uh -huh. do you have that period of time, or is it going to be since we usually get out at 1.45? Okay, so the, the timing on the exam will be 75 minutes. That's 12.30 okay. to 1.45. So, you know, you're going to find me five minutes from the end saying, you know, summarize those last golden thoughts. And <laughs> <laughs> If tomorrow you die, what are you going to say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was in New Zealand earlier this spring and I had some heart trouble. I had to go to the hospital in a hurry. So I was riding with my wife to the hospital, you know, and you think, hmm, this might not have a good outcome. So uh, what am I going to say? I better tell my wife a few things here. <laughs> Fortunately, it turned out to have a good outcome. So I didn't have to put my uh, suddenly contrived... Uh, plan into effect. Uh, Dr. Tarleton, do you have any thoughts or questions? I don't, so I guess just uh, good luck and think clearly and uh, don't, uh, don't stress about it too much. Just work through things methodically. So are there any other things that you're confused about? These things that you think, oh my gosh, I never got that from the beginning. Okay, you're good. See you on Tuesday. Um, we've got here a person from the city of Houston, Houston Recovery. Don't have any person from the city of Houston here. Okay.